introduced the last set of slides, people pointed out or that there was a risk that there would be huge opposition to it. Well, that's obviously true. There will be huge opposition to the strategy of abolishing exploitation, even if you do it by a highly democratic means like a referendum. But I want to say why I'm advocating this referendum direct democracy strategy. Why do I do it? Because I think referendums, on the one hand, they mobilize political interest in issues. You can see this if you were in Britain during the Brexit referendum or if you're in Scotland during the independence referendum. And referenda create the most favorable balance for popular measures compared to votes in an assembly like a parliament because a parliamentary assembly is always made up of a body that is over representative of the better off in society and is therefore less likely to favor radical measures the next point is that if you have something approved by referenda you build a very strong basis of popular legitimacy for the actions you're taking. I'm going to illustrate this with what may seem a strange example to you. This is Ben Ann in the Trossachs. It's a nice easy climb and you get a lovely view from the top. Behind it is Loch Catron. Now why am I talking about Loch Catron? It's a beautiful loch. You can go on trips on a steamboat on it. You can cycle along its banks. But the reason I'm focusing on this is because Loch Catron is Glasgow's water supply. In the 19th century, Glasgow was plagued by repeated outbreaks of cholera, killing large numbers of people. This was put an end to when the water supply from Loch Katrin came into use, providing people with a pure, uncontaminated water supply. Then, in the 1990s, the Tories hit on the idea that they would privatise Scottish water. They'd already privatised water in England. But up here, we just defeated their poll tax by direct action, by an anti-poll tax strike. The Govan Hill Anti-Poll Tax Union, when it heard that there was going to be this proposal to privatise water, set up a campaign against water privatisation. And we demanded of the local authority that there be a referendum on it, that it shouldn't be allowed to happen without a referendum. Strathclyde Regional Authority gave in to that demand for a referendum and in 1994 we had a referendum on it and 97% voted against privatisation. 97% of the citizens of the Strathclyde region voted against privatisation. 3% voted for. That stopped privatisation dead in its tracks. Water privatisation in Scotland ended that day. Water is still privatised in England. Here in Scotland we stopped it. Why was it dropped? On the one hand, no government with any claim to democracy could ignore a 97% vote against its policy. Secondly, they knew that if they went ahead, we would have organised a non-payment campaign against it, which would have been massive and it would have been a loss maker for whoever bought it. The point about referenda is that they can panic and stymie the upper classes. The Scottish independence referendum caused real panic in the UK establishment when polls showed we had a chance of winning. The Brexit referendum threw the established structures of the main parties into disarray. And they reveal deep trust by the political classes of any actual democracy. 
This was particularly ca the case with the Brexit referendum. Now, if we talk of having an, a, a referendum to abolish feudal tenure or a referendum to abolish exploitation as a whole, there would obviously be massive opposition to this. But having a debate on why you shouldn't have such a referendum would put the rich in an impossible position. They either have to try and justify why His Grace the Duke of Westminster is entitled to nine billion pounds, or they have to say the rest of you are just plebs with no right to judge your betters. And if they say that, how long can the existing state structure survive? How are they going to justify these characters? How are they going to justify that Viscount Portman has a fortune of 1,890 million? Or the Baroness Howard de Walden a fortune of 3,630 million? Or the Earl Cadogan 5,990 million? on which he incidentally makes 14% a year, giving him an income last year of 840 million. This is the problem that the establishment will face, is if socialists openly campaign for the abolition of exploitation and the cancellation of feudal tendencies. What sort of arguments can they use? All they can do is suggest that we shouldn't even dare think of it. But as I've shown in previous videos, it means at least a 15k a year wage increase for the average worker if we do this. So the big question is why not? Why are we hesitating? Well, there are a whole set of obstacles. First, we have to get the notion of such a referendum to public attention. Then we have to get it debated in the major political parties. We have to get it accepted by a political party. That political party then has to win an election with that in its programme. Then you actually have to get the MPs to vote for it, as the current shenanigans over Brexit show. Getting MPs to vote for something is quite another matter. Then you have to win the referendum. Well, since the referendum is so clearly in the interest of the majority of the population. I don't think that would be difficult. And finally, you have to prevent a coup occurring before or after the vote. It's clear that the process of debate on such issues would be enormously polarizing. But unless you build up a revolutionary public opinion, you can never get any kind of social revolution. But it does have implications for defence policy. The only times we've had radical change in the UK before were under Cromwell and Attlee, when there was a radical democratic army to back it up. The purely professional army we have in Britain at the moment is not necessarily the best bastion of democracy internally. A socialist government should reintroduce national service and it should recreate a territorial home guard or militia. Now these don't seem like left-wing policies but actually these are extremely left-wing policies. If we go back to Frederick Engels he wrote an article on the Prussian military question in the 1860s where he strongly defended the Prussian system of universal conscription. He said of the working class, it certainly cannot remain indifferent to the question of whether or not universal conscription is fully implemented. The more workers who are trained to use weapons, the better. Universal conscription is a necessary and natural corollary of universal suffrage. It puts the voters in a position of being able to enforce their decisions, guns in hand, against any attempted coup d'etat. On the issue of home defence, this is ridiculed by TV series like Dad's Army, but the Home Guard actually arose out of the prior efforts of the soldier Tom Wintergren, who had 
fought on the Republican side in the Spanish War. It meant that large numbers of local citizens were armed and trained in guerrilla tactics in order to avert invasion. And the side effect was that in 1945 the British population could easily have resisted any attempt to invalidate the election of the Labour government by a military coup. But politics remained central. Winning democratic legitimacy remained central. It took years of war to make the Russian army mutiny in 1917. One more year of war to make the German navy do it in 1918. But if you look at the other great anti-absolutist revolution of the 20th century, the revolution in Iran against the Shah, in that conflict the army, even though it was not a, an army on the Prussian military system, proved unwilling to use force to suppress a movement that clearly had overwhelming public support. The officers did not trust that their soldiers would have obeyed orders to suppress such a movement. And that's why winning democratic legitimacy for radical change via referendum is so important.